Hi, Jane Con. We're excited to be here and talk to you about dissecting the new wave of Jane Austen adaptations and what the future holds. I'm Jillian. I'm Yolanda. And we're the co-hosts of the Pemberley Podcast, a podcast which discusses Jane Austen and other Regency film, TV, and book adaptations. For the last seven years, we've covered stories that retell Austen's work in new ways. So why do we love Austen so much? I've always loved sweeping, romantic period pieces, so seeing one of my favorite novels come to life in new ways has always been exciting to me. And I love seeing the ways Austen's work gets reinterpreted with fresh perspectives. Austen wrote these timeless novels with themes that continue to be relevant today. Today, we're discussing the previous wave of Austen adaptations that we're marking from 2004 to 2009, and how that informed the current wave of Austen adaptations, which we're marking from 2020 to 2023. We'll provide our definitions of adaptation versus retelling versus inspired by, and what we anticipate in the next wave of Austen adaptations. First, let's define some of the terms we'll be using that are often used interchangeably. Adaptation versus retelling. An adaptation is taking the original book and adapting it to fit a new medium. An example being taking Pride and Prejudice in its novel form of over 156,000 words and condensing it to a screenplay format for a series or film. A retelling is a reimagining of the original book in a new setting. This could include modernizing the story and dialogue, changing character names, combining characters, taking out or playing up certain story elements, all while keeping true to the main plot points of the original story. An example of this being Clueless, a modern retelling of Emma where Emma Woodhouse is Cher, a rich teen living in the 90210. Ugh, as if! Shows, films, and books may fall into another category of inspired by, which is keeping in the spirit of Austen's work and loosely taking elements from one or more novels. A key example of this would be the PBS masterpiece series Sanditon, as it is based on an unfinished manuscript. Before we talk about the 2004 to 2009 wave, we have to mention the 1995 Pride and Prejudice miniseries. This set the bar for book-to-screen adaptations with a breakout role for the one and only Colin Firth that brought major heartthrob energy to Mr. Darcy. The famous scene where Mr. Darcy comes out of the lake in a billowing white shirt often gets referenced in Austen-related media. Refreshing indeed. Obviously, there's always Jane Austen adaptations getting released, but for the purposes of our discussion, the last major wave of Austen content was between 2004 to 2009. While not exclusive, there was a boom of miniseries and movies that strove to capture what the 1995 Pride and Prejudice miniseries captured. First on the list, though, is Bride and Prejudice, a 2004 film starring Ashwarya Rai, a retelling that was cinematic and way ahead of its time by casting a diverse group of actors and setting it in modern day. The rest of these adaptations stick to the original period setting such as the 2005 Pride and Prejudice starring Keira Knightley, the most famous film to come out of this wave. This adaptation was developed with a U.S. audience in mind. It was also more cinematic, a little gritty, and shows family home life as different from society life, especially when compared to its famous 1995 predecessor. It was more multidimensional than many of the shows and films that were released in this wave. The rest of the adaptations in this wave could be described as sticking to the status quo. They follow the familiar formula laid out by the 1995 Pride and Prejudice miniseries. This includes adaptations made for British TV, including Persuasion, starring Sally Hawkins, Northanger Abbey, starring Felicity Jones, Mansfield Park, starring Billy Piper, Sense and Sensibility, the 2008 miniseries, and Emma, the 2009 miniseries. The main trends of this wave are made up of predominantly TV series budgets. They're made by UK creatives with UK stars and writers, all while primarily targeting a UK audience. Since these were broadcast on local television, accessibility is difficult if you live elsewhere, and even today, they're scattered across various streaming platforms. Or just BritBox. Probably BritBox. So now let's get into the current wave, which is still in progress. We think of this wave as bursting the Austin bubble, in that beyond the UK, it's reached diverse and international audiences. There's more US producers and studios daring to take on Austin. There was even a reality dating show with Austin rules, The Courtship. Let's get into the biggest show to come out of this wave so far, Bridgerton, which premiered on Netflix in 2020. In the context of Austin, this is very loosely inspired by 
The Julia Quinn books set in the Regency period were inspired by Austen. Quinn has stated in an interview, I'd like to think that my books honor Austen by adhering to Austen ideals. For this TV series, though, creator Shonda Rhimes and showrunner Chris Van Dusen are not playing by Austen rules, but rather playing by Shondaland rules. Diversity is at the forefront of the story, and there are passionate sex scenes, and there is a lot of drama. It takes place in a fantasy-like place in history, and feels very escapist. With the mainstream success of this show, we are still seeing the impact on period TV and film. The show's success demonstrates a desire for audiences to see history in a new context, which we also see in the Bridgerton prequel series, Queen Charlotte. The show is glamorizing the Regency period. It's a fantasy version of this time with its flashy costumes, and visually, it's bright and glossy. We like this show, and we're excited to see how this inspires future Austin and period romance media. Now let's talk about Sanditon seasons 2 and 3, starring Rose Williams and Crystal Clark on PBS. This series is an inspired by, since it was posthumously published as an incomplete manuscript. Austin's 11 chapters only got us through half of the very first episode, and the rest had to be invented. After season one, the show was canceled, but after the success of Bridgerton and with passionate fan support, the series was revived at PBS for two more seasons. The fan campaign especially rallied around getting a proper Happily Ever Austin for the heroine Charlotte Haywood. New characters and storylines were added. A lot of creative liberties had to be taken to add to this world. To us, it was approached more as drama first, romance last. It focuses on character development, not on romantic storytelling. On one hand, it shows the power of Austen's name for a series based on an unfinished book to get made, but we do see inconsistencies with the execution in following an Austen story. While the story started on following Charlotte as our heroine and finding her way in this new seaside town, in seasons two and three, the story expands past Charlotte, building out the town of characters, thus shifting focus away from her core love story and friendships. Mr. Malcolm's List, starring Frida Pinto, Shape Dorisu, and Theo James, released in theaters in 2022. This film is an inspired by. It's composed of a U.S. writer, producers, and a British director. It's an original story set in Regency times with Austen-like romance. In fact, Malcolm's titular list is inspired by Darcy's list of what makes an accomplished lady. This project was long in development BB before Bridgerton, with diverse casting at the forefront. It follows Austen's cinema language with pastoral pops of color, beautiful costumes, and settings. This is a film we wanted to mention because it was hidden in the Bridgerton wave. It's a standalone film that proves the desire for this kind of story. This film holds a special place in my heart because it's the little film that could. We have been watching and cheering for its progress for as long as we've had our podcast. It's evolved from a short story, to a feature script, to a short film, to a novel, and finally a film. With so few romantic comedy films getting made lately, a Regency rom-com is a welcome addition. Next, let's talk about Persuasion, released on Netflix in 2022. This film is controversial amongst fans because it doesn't solidly plant itself in its period setting. We're categorizing it as a retelling disguised as an adaptation. It's a creative swing at blending the period with modern sensibilities. What sets this apart from other Austin adaptation films, though, is its diverse casting and movie star talent in Dakota Johnson and Henry Golding. Casting Stars has the intention of reaching a broad audience and bringing in new or casual romance fans versus just the passionate Austin fans. In applying a rom-com tone to this story, though, fans were not pleased as Persuasion is a more melancholy and mature story of heartbreak and a second chance at love. These two clashing tones are at odds throughout the film in trying to balance Anne Elliot's sadness with punchy jokes and cheeky looks to the camera. Unpopular opinion? We don't see taking big creative swings like this as a bad thing. This is definitely a result of the Bridgerton effect, in that the target audience was geared towards new romance fans. Fire Island, written by and starring Joel Kim Booster. This film premiered on Hulu in 2022. It's a retelling, and the only modern retelling in this wave. It so beautifully demonstrates the timelessness of Austen's books. Openly queer characters set on Fire Island while still addressing the class and social issues within the gay community. It follows the major plot points of the book, 
while modernizing the issues of Pride and Prejudice. This amazing film is reminiscent of the late 90s, early 2000s classic novel to film format. Think Clueless. Think Bridget Jones's Diary. It gives Austin problems modern solutions. The audience for this film is not just for Jane Austen fans. First and foremost, it's a queer romantic comedy that puts the pride in Pride and Prejudice. Lastly, Emma, starring Anya Taylor-Joy, released in theaters in 2020. This is an adaptation that also has the same producers who made the 2005 Pride and Prejudice. It's the use of bright colors, quirky music, and artistic cinematography that makes it pop. Directed by American music video director Autumn DeWilde, she gives this classic Austin story an artistic cool girl vibe. Emma feels modern, but still in her Regency time. The costumes are more decorative and fit within the aesthetic of the poppy visual language of this film. While it may be more enjoyable for the Austin fan who understands the nuances of these characters, it's the subtle yet sharp comedic timing that makes this such a fun movie to watch. This concludes this wave so far. So here's what we think audiences can expect from the next Jane Austen wave. First, diverse casting and more perspectives will be at the forefront of development. Next, the Bridgerton effect is yet to come and more Bridgerton is definitely coming. It's proven to have the potential to be an ongoing series. Bridgerton could continue to expand and giving supporting characters their limited series spotlight. Austen novels such as Mansfield Park, Northanger Abbey, and Persuasion that typically get less screen time will get made in both adaptations and or modern retellings. And finally, our last prediction is a non-English TV series. With the rise in popularity of international series in the U.S., a non-English Austin adaptation has the opportunity to break out in a big way. Streaming platforms make this content accessible, and a non-UK or U.S.-based film or show could be the next big Austin adaptation. Thanks for watching, Jane Con. What do you think? Do you agree with our predictions? Let us know! You can find us on social media at The Pemberley, and you can listen to our podcast where we discuss Jane Austen and historical romance adaptations. 